This is episode 245 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Cellular Diversity, with Dr. Thomas Zwacher. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Thomas Zvaka from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He's on the podcast to talk about his research looking into fundamental questions surrounding stem cell biology. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming up. But first, we'd like to remind our listeners about ESC and IPSC News, one of stem cell's free weekly scientific newsletters. ESC and IPSC News summarizes all of the latest research, news, jobs, and events in ESC and IPS research and delivers it right to your inbox every Wednesday. Save time and keep current with ESE and IPSC News. Subscribe for free at www.eslnews.com. All right, Arun, I'm kicking off the roundup today with the kind of stem cell adjacent story. Not exactly, you know, strictly speaking about stem cells, but it's about embryos and genetic modification thereof, which is a really hot subject in the ISSCR, which we really just returned from and I think you know the field is only burgeoning. Uh, this is a story about base editors. But first, you know, a little background. I didn't know this, but about half of all human genetic disorders are single nucleotide variations. The pathogenesis is derived from a single change in a single nucleotide chain, um, and you know because these are so prevalent, the, these gene editing technologies, uh, base editors or prime editing um, have become a really exciting uh, potential technology for addressing this disease. So generally speaking, gene editing has been blowing up, right? With uh, homology directed repair or base editing, prime editing, you know, there's all, many flavors. Um, but uh, base editing uh, for some single nucleotide conversions, base editing is the most efficient. Um, it's able to install base substitutions without inducing these double strand breaks or requiring a donor template. Um, so there's all flavors of these base editors. Cytosine base editors that have a CG to TA conversion. Um, also, there's these cytosine transversion editors. Uh, which can uh, make a CG to GC uh, edit. Um, and adenine base editors uh, that can create an AT to GC uh, conversion with few byproducts. But adenine transversion editors could play a really important role in therapeutic gene correction because um, they are able to make a targeted AT to CG or a AT to TA substitution. And, and those two substitutions alone could potentially correct 17% and 8% respectively of known pathogenic single nucleotide uh, you know, genetic diseases, right? So right there in one shot, 25% of these single nucleotide genetic diseases could be addressed with adenine transversion editors. Um, and also not to mention that it would increase uh, the diversity of outcomes you can get for these mutagenesis-based applications, which we saw a lot of that at the ISSCR and also a growing field of using mutagenesis for lineage tracing, genetic screening, or molecular evolution even to create kind of de novo proteins. So Yes, there's this need for these adenine transversion editors, but of course, like anything, it takes a lot of chemistry and engineering to get there. Uh, this is a story in Nature Biotechnology from Dali Li, who's at the East China Normal University in Shanghai, China. Also, second to last on this is, of course, David Liu, who's the godfather of you know base editing, prime editing, all this stuff. Um, and what the, the group did here is 
they fused this DNA glycosylase with the nickase Cas9 and deaminase had A8E. Um, and with that, they're able to catalyze this ad adenosine transversion uh, in a specific sequence context. And then they evolved uh, this construct and further engineered it to yield adenine to cytosine base editors uh, that precisely install A to C transversions with minimal off-target effects. Um, and then they apply this uh, to show that they could, with high efficiency, correct five pathogenic mutations in mouse embryos. Uh, and this is mouse single-cell zygotes, which around 50% average um, A to C edits. So high efficiency here, and this is where it comes around to the stem cell story. I think this whole direct editing of embryos, it, it has a lot of power for generating knockouts, et cetera, and uh, investigating these single nucleotide conversions, but also just the implications for human therapy here. I think that's that's the real takeaway for me. You know, famously, Jay Hanke, Hanku, Hanke, sorry, uh, edited these, these embryos in China um, to controversial effect, but, you know, with the high precision base editing, uh, that you get here, I think that we're talking about potentially connect correcting genetic disease in human patients. Of course, that's a long way off and we got to prove the safety, but getting all these tools into the kit, I think really, uh, raises the, the possibility, the potential, um, for these therapies to safely, uh, after careful assessment, to go into humans. And, you know, this is all the stuff that goes on in the dark, I think, in between the scandals that we're just marching along with the genetic engineering and making these things really feasible and practical. Arun, what's your takeaway from this story? Yeah, this is a tech development story. I mean, it's part of the major reason why it's in Nature Biotech. Um, I mean, David Liu is, of like you said, the godfather of all these editing-based approaches. They're lab and i know some folks who have come out of there come out of that lab the intellectual property that spins out from that particular laboratory is probably unlike any other on the level of any other in the united states i mean they're constantly churning out different types of genetically customized editing tools for in vitro and in vivo applications and i think the the reason why this is in nature biotech and why i was able to get such a high profile is of course that that embryo editing approach, I think it's good that you raise the the specter of John K. Hay because I mean that's what it kind of alludes to here, right? You have these all these editing technologies that are just marching on in their development. They're becoming more targeted, more precise, able to modify an individual's uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms to much greater ease. And inevitably, the next question is, when are these things going to be starting to be applied in, in humans? When, if ever, when it's not ever, it's a matter of time. When is there going to be a next generation of uh, human embryo editing utilizing these these base editors, prime editors, and so on. And I think after the John Kihei situation, all of us on are on alert, and light, rightfully so. Of course, the ISSCR, which we came back from the annual meeting, has a number of guidelines specifically focused on human embryo editing as well. But really, it's just a matter of time until something like this happens again, and hopefully it's a it's a much more well-regulated, well-thought-off situation than what happened with John Kihei. Um, so yeah, another tool for the tool set, but it's the application that gets me really excited. And also building on ISSCR, there was a strong emphasis on these synthetic embryo models, right? So I'm wondering if some of this technology can be intertwined or married with some of that technology as well. I think the, the, the future is the, you know, the sky's the limit for this kind of, this kind of stuff in this field. Yeah, you said it right there. I mean, combining synthetic embryo and ex vivo embryogenesis with these models for, you know, very precise editing, you know, experimentally, it really kicks open the door. And as you said, with the Jean K. Hay, Hay scandal, I mean, one silver lining and maybe unpopular opinion here, but I would say one silver lining uh, of that is that there's people walking around who have been genetically engineered. I mean, no longer crawling around, uh, walking at this point, many years have passed and, and these people are going to continue to be in the world. Uh, and although it was kind of a vigilante 
uh, application, you know, it was also, I would say, the least precise approach of the many that we have. So if if, if this can be met with, with success, however scandalous and fraught with risk, I think that uh, I personally, if I, God forbid, were the parent of an embryo that I was looking to engineer, I would be a lot more comfortable with the suite of technologies that are emerging from the labs, mostly David Liu's lab. But um, and I think that maybe silver lining again, unpopular opinion, but that that rogue application may have moved up the timeline for some of these therapies. You know that are clearly the feasibility is there, uh, and and I think it's just a matter of uh, showing that they're safe and precise, but. I don't know. Uh, I'm not celebrating John K. Hayes' rogue act there, but I think there's a lot of people in the world that potentially won't be affected by disease um, because that roll uh, ball got set rolling a little prematurely, perhaps. Yeah, I think it, the application has to be very selective. It's only in very select, specific situations where you would actually want or necessitate and you know a need to to actually do this kind of editing, base editing, prime editing, whatever of human embryos, right? I mean, there's certainly ways that you can screen preemptively embryos for for IVF and isolate those that do not have a genetic mutation, and then implant those for for uh, further development. But it's it's a very select case of you know suite of scenarios where this is ethically feasible and ethically permissible in my opinion. So just something to consider. This is just, you know, this is just the beginning of this field. And I think it's going to be in my mind, if I had to throw out a number out there, five to 10 years before this is going to happen again, and it's actually going to, uh, we might be able to use some of these technologies in some of these base editing approaches for editing human embryos, but it's not going away. That's for sure. Speaking of uh, genetic modifications and looking at uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, I'll shift gears a little bit to a in a purely in vitro study. I mean, it has clinical implications certainly, but this is a uh, an iPS modeling story, uh, a cardiac modeling story coming from the journal Circulation Research, which is one of the the best journals when it comes to basic cardiovascular biology in the world. Um, this is coming from the lab of Angel Rea in in Spain. First author is uh, Ruben Escriba, also in in Spain. The regenerative medicine program. At the uh, uh, Institute de Investigigo, I I can't even pronounce this. Of my apologies, Biomedica di Belvitege or I D I B E L L. It's a hospital, honestly, I've never heard of. Um, but this is a uh, it's a pretty incredible story that's coming out of Barcelona. That's where uh, uh, these folks are based. So this is a, a like I said, circulation research paper. It's a disease modeling paper, and just once again, kind of lamenting, looking back on ISCR. I'm a little bummed that the uh, disease modeling section and the day was saved until the very last day of the meeting. Uh, there's so much amazing disease modeling work that's been happening. I don't know if people think it's outdated now. Everybody's doing disease modeling and everybody's trying to emphasize the clinical aspects. But in my mind, that's still one of the strongest areas of basic stem cell research is in the disease modeling side of things. So, um, so this is uh, focusing on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a a disease that's associated with the thickening of the the uh, the musculature of the heart. It's a pretty serious situation. I mean, the famous example of uh, downstream implications of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are are athletes who suddenly die on the the playing field, right? And that's because they have an enlarged heart because of a genetic mutation that wasn't previously identified, leading to them uh, in in situations of exertion, overexertion. The you know the uh, for whatever reason. There, they leads to sudden cardiac arrest. Okay, really sad situation, and it's played out in a number of high profile cases over the year, right? So we're doing a a lot, and we've done a lot over the years to figure out what are the genetic situations, genetic reason as to why hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is rising, leading to some of these really sad uh, clinical phenotypes. Um, and in fact, uh, the postdoc lab that I worked in, the Seidman lab, has been looking at these g- mutations of uh, uh, variants of unknown significance for decades now, and uh, they've been able to identify hundreds of situations of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms leading to either dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is a, certainly a hot area of study. You know, perhaps the the dream is to create a catalog 
of variants of unknown significance to preemptively identify people who might be susceptible to HCM or DCM, that sort of thing, right? So here, like I said, it's a it's a basic disease modeling study, but they were trying to investigate the the genotype phenotype relationship in two siblings, you know, brother and sister here, with a really extensive family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, they are both carrying a pathogenic truncating variant in the myosin binding protein C gene, and this is a gene that's well known to have various genetic mutations leading to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. But the the, the tricky thing here is, even though these two individuals, the siblings, they have the exact same genetic mutation in myosin binding protein C, this sarcomeric protein involved in contractility, they have totally different clinical phenotypes. So one of the one of the siblings has really severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the other sibling doesn't. They're pretty clean, clinically at least. And so they were trying to understand why, why uh, such a divergent clinical phenotype based on iPS cardiomyocytes. And we're on the topic of genome editing. They use a traditional CRISPR-Cas9 um, genetic modification approach here to um, first generate patient-specific iPSCs from these two siblings, and then create isogenic lines by correcting the genetic mutations in the myosin binding protein C, right? And so the, uh, the, the, the in vitro phenotype was able to recapitulate the clinical phenotype to some extent. The, the person with the severe cardiomyopathy had the most severe phenotype even in the dish. But what they found was that there's an additional genetic modifier in a myosin heavy, myosin heavy chain 7 gene that is actually present in the sibling with the severe clinical phenotype. And that's the reason why both the in vitro iPS cardiomyocytes from that individual and the person itself, that's the reason why that person has that severe phenotype. Uh, it's that modifier mutation that's actually conferring the the severe clinical effect, and they identify it through you know additional sequencing, um, and they the, the I think it's a beautiful basic study to actually get to the bottom of why you know these siblings, even though they may have just that major mutation that's the same, uh, why there's such a difference in their clinical phenotype, and, and perhaps this is can be extended to additional studies as well. Right? There's there's more to it than just a single variants of unknown significance that can be driving a clinical phenotype. Oftentimes, there's so many other genetic modifiers, whether it's ten adjacent genes, genes completely in a different region of genome. Um, it's a it's a really nice basic science study that's showing the power of IPS modeling and the power of CRISPR-based uh, modeling intersecting with IPS modeling. Um, so it's a it's a unique platform to functionally assess the effect of genetic modifiers and driving such a sad disease in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I mean, there's so much that's being done now to screen for kids who have HCM. I mean, you have kids who are involved in sports, right? So, you know, and and certainly there's people in high school and college, college athletes who are routinely being screened uh, for potential HCM. But I mean, one hope downstream, like I said, is we can create a catalog of genetic variants um, that if you have a particular variant, then perhaps it's in your best interest to uh, to be super careful when it comes to doing exertion or really high level athletics. So uh, nice disease modeling study. I'm a fan. I'm a fan too. Uh, good old fashioned detective work is what this is to me. Although I shouldn't say old fashioned. This is more representative of this new era, newfangled detective work in, in a clinical setting that combines, you know, the clinical workup, of course, uh, the, the, you know, identification of a phenotype and a differential presentation, but then adding in the genomics um, and then the IPS cell generation and the genetic engineering and the modeling, um, all for like a very unique and personalized situation, you know, and phenomenon. And ultimately converging on a real insight, a mechanistic insight that, yeah, maybe it's not going to change the outcome for this patient or maybe other patients, but as you said, uh, going to have a deeper well of diagnostic criteria and, and to understand the diversity of disease and, and maybe candidates that um, 
should avoid strenuous activities in, in certain contexts. So I, I love a story like this that starts with an individual case. You know, you have these case studies that, that are famous in, in medicine and clinical case studies, but they're kind of like a one-off. Uh, so it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. Uh, oftentimes they can apply, but when you see these strange case studies, I, I, I'm very impressed that it's not just documenting this is the presentation, but actually going deep into the etiology on a genomic level. So this is next gen detective work and very impressive. Uh, and I think just really emblematic of, of the type of medicine that is done nowadays. Yeah, I, I think the dream and certainly my former mentors, the Sidemans will believe in this dream is that sequencing will become cheap enough under a hundred bucks or whatever, whole exome sequencing, where that'll be part of your routine workup and you'll just have it, I don't know if at birth or at some point early in life, where you'll have your genetic information and your doctor will be able to refer back to this genetic information to uh, for for downstream clinical diagnoses and, and predictive uh, situations like this. For example, if you have this particular set of genetic mutations and modifiers, Perhaps uh, your doctor would be able to tell you maybe you shouldn't play, you know, soccer or basketball because you have a chance of um, <laughs> honestly dying on the field because of this severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of questions associated with what I just described. One is being, uh, to, you know, training a group of doctors who can understand this genetic information. And I think we're very far from that. I think it's starting to integrate itself into the medical school curriculum. But right now, if I go to my primary care physician and I show them my genetic information, they're, they're going to have no idea what to do with it. you know. And maybe down the road, we'll be able to loop in AI or something to help the doctors make these diagnoses. But that's a whole other can, can of worms, I suppose. Yeah, another can of worms for the future. We'll unpack that. I'm counting on AI personally. It's either going to destroy us or save us. But uh, staying in the field of disease modeling, I've got a, a great story from my guy, Gab Sangley, close friend, colleague, known him for about 20 years, and he just keeps chugging along, killing it. Um, here, he's using iPS cells to unpack Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, Parkinson's uh, characterized typically by loss of midbrain dopaminergic neurons. Um, and this happens in large part, it's thought due to the formation of these inclusion bodies called Lewy bodies uh, that are made up mostly of this pathological aggregates of alpha-synuclein. Um, and that alpha-synuclein aggregate is also a hallmark of Parkinson's disease, but also Lewy body dementia, right? So um, it all lines up. And the synucleinopathy is the key pathology that underline, under, underlies the uh, uh, advance of Parkinson's disease and its devastating effects. Uh, and of course, we know a lot of this by studying post-mortem human brain, uh, people with Parkinson's disease. That's really the, the best way to understand the pathology, uh, notwithstanding animal models, which have also been very useful, but don't fully recapitulate the, the pathology of Parkinson's disease. Um, and of course, recently, you know, we were just at ISSCR hearing from uh, Lorenz, not about his dopaminergic neurons, about four or five other types of neurons that he's making in there, but, the, you know, the landmark trial at Blue Rock is studying the efficacy of dopaminergic neurons in the context of Parkinson's, and they've recruited numerous patients. It's ongoing. We haven't heard the results yet, but that's the idea, right? That's the paradigm. We'll make these dopaminergic neurons and we'll introduce them into the patient. Um, but the alternative thing that you can do with uh, dopaminergic neurons is model disease, right? Use iPS cells to, to model Parkinson's disease pathology. The problem there is that when you reprogram the fibroblasts or whatever from patients with Parkinson's disease, it also resets the pathological state to an embryonic condition. You know, we often lament this immature neurons or immature cardiomyocytes. It's difficult, um, perhaps, for these cells to recapitulate the disease. Uh, so 
that's where Gabsan came in with this unique approach. He leverages optogenetics, which, you know, optogenetics uh, is this method by which you manipulate proteins that can allow light induced uh, spatiotemporal control of protein activity interaction. Um, in this case, including homo oligomerization, right? You can create these aggregates um, on command using light. And that's what they did here. Gab Sang, who's at John, Johns Hopkins, they developed this optogenetics assisted alpha synuclein aggregation induction system. Uh, the acronym there is OASIS. Um, and it really rapidly on command induces these alpha synuclein aggregates. Um, it causes toxicity in both IPS, Parkinson's disease, IPS, midbrain, dopaminergic neurons, also midbrain organoids. Uh, and they leverage this OASIS approach to conduct primary compound screening. They identified five candidates um, and ultimately settled on one that significantly, this BAG 956, BAG 956, you might hear more about that, significantly reduces or reverses uh, the characteristic Parkinson's disease phenotype, um, both in vitro in these cells, but also in vivo in transplanted cells by uh, promoting this aut autophagic clearance of the aggregates. So, you know, for me, I love these stories because it's it's applying the iPS cells in the way that they were always meant to be applied, um, or one of the ways that they'd meant to be applied. Uh, but they, I wouldn't say they've fallen short, but we've reached a lot of obstacles, namely this, can they recapitulate the phenotype in the short time scale or without living in the niche for the lifetime of the patient, et cetera. Um, here, Gab Sang just brute forced it. You know, he, he created the aggregates, thereby recapitulating the phenotype and finding candidates that clear the disease in a kind of indirect way by just ramping up autophagy in this case. Um, so highlighting a, a drug candidate that, yeah, I know we're not all getting Parkinson's disease because we're shining light on our optogenetic proteins, but the native disease may also be responsive to this increase in autophagy. Uh, and so I think here, Gab Sang and his group may have identified a real candidate that may be worthwhile entering into at least preclinical animal trial, but even considering for, for human use. So uh, an ex another exciting entry from Gab Sang in his series of earth shattering and world changing science. Congratulations, Dr. Lee. Yeah, cool study. Another um, tool for the toolkit here, especially it's a really neat approach to this artificially induced alpha synuclein uh, aggregation using optogenetics. It's not something I would have thought of. Uh, I guess that's not why I'm doing the work, right? But uh, the other part of it is more along the lines of the big picture, right? There's this FDA Modernization Act 2.0, right? And now now the thought is you can use more of these preclinical systems, IPS-based systems to identify drug candidates that be able to progress into the clinic and clinical trials independent of animal clinical models, like preclinical models, like mouse models, right? That's the the hope. I'm still not sold on it because I still think you need to validate whatever you find in an IPS system, an IPS drug screen in an animal model. And certainly there's limitations with every single model system out there. Uh, IPSC is, of course, immaturity, even though you're able to identify you know, things like this, this bag 956. And even the previous paper that I mentioned, they were using immature IPS cardiomyocytes, but we're still able to recapitulate a clinical phenotype. So nonetheless, it's those models are, are imperfect. Animal models are also imperfect, as we know. Um, so I think... Uh, I'm a in general, I'm a fan of the FDA Modernization Act, but I, I think we we're not going to be getting rid of animal models anytime soon. That's the way I'm I'm thinking about it. You know, this also links back to a paper that we talked about maybe a few weeks ago, a few episodes ago. Similar approach, uh, phase one to a clinical trial in ALS, another neurodegenerative disease. Um, uh, with this drug, rapinirole, a drug that was actually also identified by IPS drug discovery. And I don't know if there was any ad additional preclinical animal work associated with that study, but 
it's in general, we're moving in the right direction, right? We have to supplement your models with other models. No model is perfect. Animal models are not perfect. IPSCs are not perfect. But in general, I'm a big fan of this modernization approach from the FDA. Yeah, I am too. Although I, I, I guess I'm a little confused about how to read it. Like maybe is it a either or type idea? I don't think it's that. I think it's as you said about uh, marshaling as many of the resources as we can, not replacing animal models. I think you know if if you read the the mandate there um, or the act uh, is that the FDA no longer mandates animal testing for every new drug development protocol. And yeah, I, I get that um, that maybe to identify a candidate uh, and to you know commence the the preclinical study, uh, you don't necessarily need to do animal testing. But I'd be surprised to see drug candidates that just act on cells in addition and then go into phase one. I mean, that seems a little bit uh, strange to me. So I don't read it as a kind of, you know, proxy or surrogate. I, I see it as a complementary means of, of identifying candidates and mechanisms that are really uniquely specific to the molecular biology of the human. Um, and then uh, to move on and test it kind of in the meta state of an organism. Um, so, yeah, I, I think these are really complementary approaches. As you were saying, Arun, I'm a little confused as to whether or not this Modernization Act is meant to displace animals as the, the major testing ground for preclinical therapies. I, I personally think that would be, I mean, rushed, I, unnecessary maybe. I don't know. I don't have a very uh, deep well of, of knowledge in terms of the animal uh, rights and protections there. Uh, but I, I do think that there really is no substitute for animal models uh, when we're talking about screening drugs and therapies for humans. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think part of it is perhaps a political climate that we're in, right, where animal rights groups certainly have a lot of influence and rightfully so. Um, but I agree with you. I think in at least in the near future, I don't envision a scenario where a preclinical drug model, um, a preclinical identified drug will will progress to clinical trials without some sort of in vivo characterization as well. I mean, that, that valley of death is already so wide when it comes to drug approval. Using exclusively in vitro approaches, maybe in my pessimistic view, will just widen the value. But hey, again, we also have so many other in silico models that are emerging based on IPS data sets in a lot of situations. So maybe the combination of in vitro and in silico is, is all we need. But hey, maybe I'm just pessimistic. I don't know. But in one situation where we're definitely not getting rid of animal models anytime soon, um, and this is for studying evolution and also studying development, EvoDevo, the intersection of those two fields, right? And that's what Miki Ebisuya, our friend uh, who's been on the show not too long ago, has done here in this uh, cell stem cell paper. Miki and colleagues have developed what's called a stem cell zoo to uncover intracellular scaling of developmental tempo across mammals. This is building on a lot of really cool work that the Ebisuya lab has done over the last couple of years, looking at the segmentation clock and really figuring out the timing of different developmental, early developmental processes using in vitro models, using, um, uh, well, these are in vitro models, but they're derived from unique species. Okay. So these are, uh, it's the intersection of the in vivo and the, the in vitro here, right? So there's differential speeds in biochemical reactions across different species out there. And that's been one of the perhaps hypotheses as to why there are differences in developmental tempo between mice and animals. Mice develop much faster than, than humans. They have a much shorter gestational period, sure, and a shorter lifespan in general too, right? But what they're trying to figure out here are the underlying mechanisms that are controlling these species-specific kinetics, right? And that, that still needs to be determined. So what they did here is they differentiated uh, pluripotent stem cells, both iPSCs and ESCs, uh, from a variety of different animal species. Okay, so they, of course, they use the mouse and the human since we can 
easily differentiate those IPSCs and ESCs of, and have been doing for many years, but they also use some pretty unique mammalian species out there as well to, to examine the, the clock, the developmental clock uh, over the course of uh, mammalian development. So they used marmoset, rabbit, cattle, and rhinoceros too. Pretty wild. I hope one day I can work with rhino IPSCs. That's my dream. But what they saw here is that the segmentation clock periods, so like the, the speed of the segmentation clock, of the six different species they characterized did not scale with animal body weight, but with the, the, the length of the embryogenesis period, okay? Um, and in particular, they looked at a gene that they've looked at in the past. I remember talking about this in one of their other in vitro modeling papers, HES7, HES7. This is a core segmentation clock gene that's really depending determining the cyclical nature of that segmentation clock. And they looked at the biochemical kinetics of that gene, and it showed actually really nice scaling with the, the species-specific segmentation clock period. Um, but the other thing is that the cellular me metabolic rates didn't actually show an evident correlation. Uh, and instead, the genes involving the biochemical reaction speeds showed an expression pattern that scales with the segmentation clock period. So it's that correlation with the, the speed of biochemical reactions that's happening in the mouse cells or the human cells that's actually correlating with the, the speed of that segmentation clock. It's a, a really neat in vitro developmental story. I love these kind of Evo Devo stories that are emerging in stem cell biology, whether it's using organoids to study uh, brain development in different species, or in this situation, using these um, uh, somatoids or gastroloids or whatever, these segmentation clock analogs to study biochemical processes and early developmental processes that ultimately lead to the formation of somites in the segmentation uh, situation. Um, these are both amazing examples of how basic stem cell biology can be used to understand why we're different, why we're different from our mammalian ancestors or mammalian uh, cousins, you know? And <laughs> the, the thing that I was thinking, and I think they actually mentioned it here in the story, is um, in the future, they really want to extend this to non-mammalian species, but it's been so tough generating embryonic stem cells and iPSCs from non-mammalian species. Um, but I think that's 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 a whole brand new frontier that we uh, will probably navigate in the in the next five to ten years. Um, so really neat basic developmental story here. I'm a big fan. I wouldn't pit, put it past Mickey. I mean, when, when we had her on the show, she was alluding to this. That was a while back. She was alluding to this work that she was doing uh, and her goal to make this IPS zoo. Um, and here we are. She's achieved it. So congratulations. Very impressive. And I'm, I'm waiting for all those lizards, alligators, etc. cetera, um, to make the list. But, uh, you know, amazing work, fundamental insight, uh, really thought provoking. And I think practical in terms of if, if there is a clock and you can identify what governs that clock, then perhaps you can manipulate, accelerate or slow down that clock. Uh, highly pertinent when we're talking about accelerating differentiation or development uh, for practical purposes, generate tissue, but also maybe slowing things down. You know, I'm, I'm getting to, to, to my mid forties here. I'd like to put the brakes on a minute. Yeah. I think your segmentation clock has been already well, pretty well established. I don't think we can go backwards and reprogram you, although maybe Altos Labs has something to say about that. We'll find out. Um, yeah, I, I agree with it. I'm, I love what Mickey's doing. I think they're developing such cool model systems to interrogate early developmental processes. And then again, going back to the very first story, maybe we can integrate these with some of the early synthetic embryo models and take this kind of study to the next level. Who knows? Yeah, you got me, man. My, my, development the clock is cracked but uh <laughs> there's still a chance partner don't write me off um maybe we talk about the bat developmental clock with uh dr zvaka in just a minute add that to the stem cell zoo but before we get there i got a quick message from stem cells uh as research using pluripotent stem cells advances toward the clinic there is a renewed focus on cell quality Visit www.stemcell.com slash cell quality to explore ways to assess your human pluripotent stem cells and learn about essential quality attributes to consider for gene editing, disease modeling, and maintenance. 
All right, everybody, on today's episode, we have a special guest from just up the street from me, Dr. Thomas Vaca, who is Professor of Regenerative and Developmental Biology, also Director of the Huffington Center for Cell-Based Research in Parkinson's Disease at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Zvaka's research focuses on fundamental questions surrounding stem cell biology, including how to reverse the process of differentiation and reprogram any given cell type into a pluripotent stem cell. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. I mean, your lab is very unique in that you're not limited to a single tissue or disease type. And in fact, you've worked on a bunch of areas of interest ranging from cardiovascular biology, which is what I work on, to Parkinson's disease, and even most recently, viral pathogen in bat-induced pluripotent stem cells. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, and tell us a little bit about the overall approach of your lab, because you have such this ability to stretch your lab interests across a broad range of areas, and maybe what unifies the different parts of your lab. Well, definitely... Uh... What we are mostly interested in is asking and answering questions. It is less process-driven like some other labs are. We have certain key technologies. They look into these technologies often. The PI started as a postdoc acquiring a particular skill and carries this over to, um, to his own, his, her own lab. Now, we, um, we never did this, right? And maybe perhaps uh, I started my lab 20 years ago, uh, Maybe I regret it now <laughs> because it is a very hard way because, like you said, suddenly you're not really the specialist there, right? You, you have to rely on collaboration. And when you look at our research portfolio, what we have published, what we are working on, we heavily rely on other scientists who bring in expertise. And maybe perhaps that's what I like the most, right? You're sort of not in your basement doing your experiments, uh, but really out there challenging, prevailing views on, on certain questions and doing this in a, in a collaborative way. So this should be done a lot more, in my opinion, in biology and other fields. Look at physics, right? Where you have each project are 300 scientists, right? And, and and so on and so forth. In biology, it's perhaps through the funding structure, the, the classical R1, and, and so on and so forth, it still fosters this, this uh, um, single lab doing everything research. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I could see asking and answering questions how, how that would come about in your case in particular, um, because you know your, your postdoctoral training was at a time and at a place where really the whole world of stem cell biology was kicked open. So there was a million paths you could take from that starting point. So I can see why, you know, you just one question after the next in your career. Um, as I said there, you, your postdoctoral training was at Wisconsin, birthplace of human embryonic stem cells, and your career path has really run in parallel to the arc of human pluripotent stem cell research, I would argue. Uh, so you've not only borne witness to all the transformative changes that have come about, but also made your own fair share of pivotal contributions, as you said, um, dependent, but I would say in collaboration with all kinds of scientists. And I think that's really the great thing about your research is you've, you've really, you know, dipped your beak in a lot of different fields. So what do you think is the most or one of the most critical advances that you've borne witness to over that time? And what is something that has surprised you? over that, you know, roughly two, two decades in, in which so much progress has been made? Um, that's a good question. Um, and I actually like that you went back to, to my scientific childhood as, because it was really formative. At that time, late 90s, early 2000s, Jamie's lab, Jamie always talked about his lab as being a zoo. Right. We tried all kinds of different things. Microarray suddenly emerged. We wanted to see microarray. How cool is that? Right. And so you're absolutely right. So what um what, what were the biggest surprises? Um the, the, I, I think I can name definitely one, which is IPS. I I don't think anyone has seen this coming. Everyone wanted to reprogram with somatic nuclear transfer. It it looked like a really difficult problem, right? It, which genes to introduce at which time point, uh, 
no one would have thought that we're just four, right? And that, that they can be readily through an um, scientific process identified and used, and that it is so robust. I mean, after the paper was published, literally uh, um, weeks later, the first labs already had their own iPS cells, right? It, it's so easy. And I think in, in the field, this was, a, I would say, a big surprise that this works and it is so robust. And of course, it changed the way how we do science now. Yeah, I think that's been perhaps the biggest revolution in stem cell biology over the last 15 years, iPSCs. And here we are, and your lab has actually published on some very exciting iPS applications as of late. As, as of late. Uh, you actually, in my mind, published one of the coolest papers of the last year, a cell paper that actually made bat iPSCs and revealed an, an you know, an unusual entanglement between the host and the viruses. I think one of the most exciting parts of this paper was the reactivation of these endogenous bat viral sequences in these iPSCs, which actually held reservoirs of viral particles after reprogramming. It's pretty astounding. So tell us more about this paper, this particular work, how it came about, um, and really the difficulty, the difficulty of doing it in terms of the biosafety regulations and maybe even the potential of the model for studying viral pathogens. Yes. Uh, so we, um, it, again, this is a collaboration. This is the theme, right? With a virologist. We work with a virologist. This is Adolfo Garcia Sastre, also at Mount Sinai, a few years ago, where we explored brain organoids, right? And with Zika virus, right? And, and now in, in the early pandemic, literally in, in March, he contacted me. Can you also make lung organoids? <laughs> and I asked why, right? And, and, Little did we know, we heard in the news about the virus coming, et cetera, right? And so we teamed up and optimized a protocol for lung differentiation. Now we went the other way around and tried to cheat at every corner. We didn't want to make the most perfect lung organoids that most faithfully recapitulate the real structure. But our end goal was how easy are these cells infectable with SARS-CoV-2 and do certain drugs really work? And we came up with this protocol. It takes only five to seven days. It can be automated and gives high, high infection rates with SARS-CoV-2. And the first drug I remember, this was in, in March or April. So it worked relatively quickly. The first drug, remdesivir, was highly effective in, in culture. So this showed us uh, several things. Number one, it showed us... Uh, the virus kills the human cells within a day. And when we saw the first results, right, we were all quite shocked, even Adolfo, right, who see, has seen many different viruses. So, so we knew something really big is coming in terms of viruses and, and, uh, and, and pandemic. The, the second uh, thing that we learned from this is that the system can be used for drug screening. Yeah. And, and this is what we did since, collaborated with, by now, probably almost a dozen of groups that they have their particular approach to, to quench the virus, to inhibit viral replication, and so on and so forth. And now, this was sort of fun, right? The pandemic starts, you, you, you develop a new model system, you hope you have impact, right, with, with your study. But... Um, I was also, so this is being on top of things in a way, right? There's something new, you explore this. But I like to be at the bottom of things as well. And there was from the beginning, uh, uh, from I, I believe the first SARS-CoV-2 sequence in Nature paper, it said right there in the title, a bad born disease. And I was curious about that and started reading. And indeed, these coronaviruses have high similarity with coronaviruses. So SARS-CoV-2 has a lot of similarity with uh, coronaviruses that can be um, that can be found in in bats. And apparently, the bats don't get sick, right? And and so from there on, we were all um, we, at that time, March, April, we all had time to read papers, right? If you remember. And and so while we were developing the human system, I started reading about bats. And I got more and more fascinated. These are such unusual mammals, right? And, and I will tell you about a few properties. Probably the most obvious is they fly, right? It's the only mammal that can fly. And, and if you think about this, this requires enormous amount of adaptation, right? And we can maybe later talk about these evolutionary advances and why they occur and how we can actually study them. 
But th then there were other properties as well. The bats are extremely long lived. Some of them live 40 to 60 years. And imagine a mammal of the size of, of a mouse, right? That lives 60 years. There are these famous correlation plots between body size, metabolic rate, and uh, and uh, longevity, right? And and we, we, all the animals nicely line up, right? And and the bats are all the way out there, right? And extreme anomaly in in this sense. The other interesting thing is they, they don't develop cancer. You can't find cancer papers on bats, right? They, they don't have them in the zoo, etc. And so um, I found these. Uh, uh, these aspects really interesting. And another thing is uh, also unusual for uh, for mammals, um, except for rodents, is the enormous biodiversity. There are at least 1,500 species of bats, potentially even over 2,000. And this is unheard of again. All the other mammals are pretty boring. We have like three elephants and two tigers and, and whatnot, right? And, and so obviously there's something intrinsic to, to the bat's biology that makes them so unusual. So, so both things. Wouldn't it be cool to have a lung system with IPSs, but from a bat? And study when we infect SARS-CoV-2, what happens to the cells? Why are they resistant? What, what, what is really the, the secret sauce, so to say? But the other thing is by creating an in vitro model system, um, we could tackle or start begin thinking about tackling um, these other issues like longevity, like um, cancer, and and so on and so forth. This this totally did make sense to me, right? Now I the, the only thing I couldn't find in the literature is a paper on bad IPS cells, and so I was stunned and shocked, right? The, the field of bad biology was basically um, that yes, there are researchers that have bad colonies. And we can talk about this in a second. But typically, these are fruit bats right, that you can keep in captivity. Not the bat that we were interested in, which was the greater horseshoe bat, Rhinophilus ferromequinum. That's an insect-eating bat. And no one was able to, to keep these bats in captivity. So an ideal case to produce an in vitro system. And apparently, no one accomplished this. So. This is where we stood and where the idea was uh, basically born, right? Um, again, in March 2020. So, um, so how to even begin, right? And the number one thing is we, we needed a bat, right, for reprogramming. And so I contacted a an, an collaborator, an old collaborator from my time in, in, at Baylor, Richard Berenger who actually happened to study bats. And I asked him about this. Where, where do you know of somebody who may have either fibroblast or studies rhinophilus uh, um, bats? And he gave me a list of researchers. I contacted all these researchers. And uh, most actually said there was a researcher in uh, UCLA. She, she said she cannot even get into her lab. UCLA had a very strict lockdown. Um, other researchers didn't really have any fibroblast. I contacted the San Diego Zoo because they have a collection. It's called, I believe, a living zoo. Um, they have a collection of fibroblasts for, for species preservation. And they, they actually had an emergency meeting to discuss if they can send us fibroblasts because they were also under lockdown, right? And, and so they sent me a list. Indeed, they had a number of bats as fibroblasts, but unfortunately not horseshoe bats, right? And, and so this went on for, for a few weeks until uh, through a, a collaborator, um, we identified a researcher in, in southern Spain, Javier Juste. He studies horseshoe bats, and he offered us uh, to, to send us samples. Now, this was really unique for several reasons. First, because he's a field researcher, he doesn't like to kill the bats, right? He likes to study them. Um, furthermore, Spain, so this was moving into April. You remember first Italy and then Spain was under complete lockdown with curfews, with, with all kinds of things that were happening. And so how would we accomplish this? He, he needed uh, a number of, uh, not, not only permits to kill the bats, he needed uh, special permits to be even outside and so on and so forth. And 
I, I think it's remarkable what he was able to accomplish in terms of paperwork in, in a very short period of time. The other problem was um, getting the bats to New York. Um, because there were, if you remember, there were no flights to Europe between Europe and and um, and so so we discussed even options like contacting DARPA because they had military flights coming over. Ultimately, FedEx reopened flights once a week, and so here we had this framework. All the permits were there. Javier was ready, and we had basically this one night in May, uh, where he went out with his postdoc and caught us, uh, caught us with two bats, OK? The, the permit required that he kills the bats, right? And so, it is, so he had to sacrifice the bat, um, put them in, in, in um, falcon tubes, and, and send them to us. So you can imagine the next morning, <laughs> us getting a styrofoam box with, with these bats. Um, the, I, I, I was there with uh, with my research associate. We dissected the bats we, we, because we wanted to establish fibroblast. What was a stroke of luck was that one of the bats was actually pregnant, was a female, and there was a bat fetus in there. And this was immediately interesting to us because, as you know, embryonic fibroblasts are a lot easier to reprogram. And so we, we thought that this would provide a unique opportunity. If it turns out to be difficult to reprogram, to get the job done, it would be most likely uh, with embryonic fibroblasts, right? And so we de derived embryonic fibroblasts. We call them BEFs, bad embryonic fibroblasts, but also fibroblasts from all the other tissues. But we froze everything down and started first with a canonical Yamanaka protocol. And as for other researchers who tried in the field, uh, it didn't work. Okay, so. Here we have it. Uh, we were discussing should we uh, should we um, clone the bat OCT4 and SOX2 because we were using human factors, of course, right? And we um, discussed a number of other things. Uh, ultimately, to, to make a long story short, but maybe you want to also hear more about this. Uh, what we notice is there were actually colonies forming when you look very carefully. And then this is again if you work with uh, IPS, ES cells for 20 years, you just know how they look like, right? It's like um, a very particular visual morphology. I can't even describe. And I saw a very small colonies here and there. So I knew something is happening, but it, it needs optimization. This was a key moment because it, we were motivated. We started playing with different factors. And ultimately, um, what turned out, and it was basically an iterative process. We added another factor. One obvious one was FGF which we did, and it made the colonies bigger. And another one was stem cell factor. So, so we had like an array of the different factors optimized one by one, put everything together, and got, for the first time, really good looking, nice IPS colonies. We had to still optimize the picking process. We, nothing really worked, trypsin, anything, except for low EDTA. Now, in retrospect, this, um, this all sound uh, trivial or easy, but if you really work with every single component, it, it's sometimes weeks, right? And so establish the first cell lines from these embryonic fibroblasts. This happened uh, over the summer. And we did, there was another really important event that summer, 2020, in July, the, the bat genome was published, the Hoshu bat genome. And this was really important because how do you do RNA seq without an annotated genome, right? How do you design even primers for for your factors? And so we didn't know this at that time, but it was a very important event. The researcher who published this genome, Emma Teeling, University College Dublin, is an advocate, studies bats for for over twenty years is trying to sequence the genome of every single bat. They have a consortium called BAT1K that, that, that puts effort into sequencing genomes. So anyway, we had the genome, we, we had the cells. And so the first RNA-seq data um, came back 
and it was totally an IPS cell. It just had everything that I, I didn't even expect this. Right? Uh, it just every single pluripotency effect, everything we wanted to see was there, while all the fibroblast uh, markers were, were gone, but expressed in the embryonic fibroblast. So, so this was a key moment, seeing the RNA-seq data. We embarked on a process to um, differentiate these iPS cells into the first, the first principal lineages, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. We used, by the way, standard protocols and kits even. Uh, for example, a stem cell technology kit that allowed us to, uh, it's a free lineage differentiation protocol, some organoid uh, protocols. Basically, everything is optimized for human, of course. The, the, the growth factors are human. But strangely enough, it, it still works on bats. And that's, of course, the power of Evo Devo, right? the evolutionary developmental biology. But essentially, there's not much invention in terms of protein structure, et cetera. So we, I think we benefit a lot from this. Um, so the differentiation protocols worked. Uh, we tried teratomas. Um, they also worked, but the tumors were tiny, tiny little. Right? They all had, they had everything what you expect uh, in a teratoma, but they were very small. Probably because of the anti-cancer properties of these cells, right, if you think about this. Um, yeah, so this was, uh, until then, the story was pretty straightforward, right? But something else happened, and, and Arun, you alluded to this already, and this, this is this weird virus thing, the endogenous virus. Um, so from early on, there was one aspect that I didn't entirely understand, which was a morphological feature in these bad IPS cells. They had these tiny little, we call them vesicles, shiny vesicles surrounding the nucleus. And uh, initially, I thought maybe with some lipid or, or whatnot. Right? And, and so we, we went to the Mount Sinai electron microscopy core and... <laughs> What we got back was quite surprising because many of these vesicles were filled with virus-like structures. Some of them really resemble almost full viruses, while others are just only remotely similar to viruses. And, and, and this was, in a way, really interesting. We went back into the literature. Others have noticed an unusual accumulation of endogenized virus sequences in bad genomes. This is, this is a known fact. And so what seems to happen is the process of reprogramming, which is known to reactivate endogenous virus sequences to some degree, did the same thing here in bats. But because there were so many different virus sequences, we got this massive recreation of ancient viral-like sequences and proteins in our bat cells. Yeah, and the, the rest is in the story, as Arun alluded to there, this activation of these endogenous viruses. And it was it was really one of those rare stories for me that provides uh, both the technical and conceptual advance, but also has, uh, you know, the, the unexpected surprise, as you were just talking about, all these surprises along the way, as, as well as just like a hint of the bizarre here with the bats, because everything is a little bit strange. Um, relative to the human and new. Uh, and this idea that the, the bad IPSCs essentially wake up the fossilized viruses is crazy and a little bit scary, honestly. But as you said, um, as Arun said, the translational value resides in understanding how do bats tolerate these nascent viruses. They probably have some kind of intrinsic suppression mechanisms there that govern the size of the colonies, as, as you were using as an example there. Um, but apart from, you know, future experiments, as you talked about in the paper, um, modeling viral activity in organoids, for example, to look at tissue specificity. Do, do you have designs to conduct experiments in actual bats? I mean, I can imagine that it's pretty difficult to set up and maintain co colonies of bats for research. These horseshoe bats, colonies don't even really exist. W what's the, the deal there? I mean, maybe not you in New York going to have a bunch of bats in a, in a room somewhere, but how do you interface with researchers to actually conduct work in living bats? Because clearly the whole organism is a, is a much better platform for study than you know cell culture. That's right. So uh, really important, it's a model, in vitro model system with all the nice things about it. Right? We can do CRISPR, RNA-seq, left and right, but, but it is an in vitro model system. 
Um, we since then we teamed up already with with a number of researchers that have bad colonies, and so they sent us uh, fibroblasts from from this colony, and we were able to reprogram them. And so now we can um, go back and forth and ask exactly both Paris differences, the high resolution of in vitro studies versus whole animal. Obviously, in the in vitro system doesn't have any real immune system apart from the native immunity while the whole animal has everything in it right and so so you can go back and forth and i think it provides us with a beautiful very powerful system to to untangle that mystery why do bats don't get sick from viruses yeah so let's move on a little bit to the i guess the translational side of things so you also stemming from this work even started a a company recently you know focused on uh, this exact area of study, Paratus Sciences, a biotech startup company with the objective of improving human health and health security through an understanding of bat biology. I mean, it's a very relevant area of study given everything that we're talking about and the ability of bat pathogens to contribute to human disease. So tell us a little bit about what you want to accomplish with this particular startup. That's right. So so we, um, again, are at the bottom of things, exploring fundamental mechanisms. And it's fun. It's research. It's science. Right. At the same time, I also felt uh, the need to, to take this further right, in, in terms of drug discovery. And so can we learn certain things from bats, like a particular interaction with a virus and a particular ability to create anti-inflammatory proteins, um, a particular ability for an anti-aging or DNA protecting factor. Can we extract that information in a useful way and apply modern biotech, pharmaceutical drug development on it? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things nowadays uh, in pluripotent stem cell research is a big rush, not a rush, because it's been decades, right? But a, a lot of movement now into the private sector and commercial industrial application in order to translate it and that, your effort as well at paradise presumably which is you know i think i saw a hundred million dollars of funding raised for that so like clearly the numbers are there right the numbers are there and i think we're poised uh, to act and, and move some of the science into translation to the clinic and clearly the covid pandemic uh, really laid bare the, the unmet need there. And as you're describing, the bats seem to be this amazing resource, which, but for COVID, maybe we wouldn't appreciate it. So I'm, I'm looking on the bright side of that, but shifting gears a bit uh, from the bats, which we've been dwelling on happily. Um, you know, Arun mentioned the outset, your research interests are, are quite diverse. Uh, although once you go down a rabbit hole, you go deep. And these bats took you to, to like the, the core of the earth. Um, but uh, you also kind of said there that all the diverse interests are unified by just asking questions and 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 looking for answers, right? And also the common thread of, of collaboration with all these other groups. Um, so I have to ask. I mean, looking at your website, I saw that one of your projects is investigating the notion of quantum mechanics-based relationship between molecular assemblies and cell behavior. I mean, we're really switching gears here. But I have to ask this because I think that you do bring this unique insight here where you can bring in all these threads and weave them into a tapestry of understanding. I want to understand how, how quantum mechanics gets in there. Can you elaborate on that idea for us a bit? That's right. So um, we have, um, this is again a collaboration with a researcher at Princeton, Greg Scholes. He's a quantum physicist. And he studies a particular quantum phenomenon in biological system which is photosynthesis. So pho photosynthesis is 100% efficient, right? And when that's just incredible, and it is thought that part of uh, why it is so efficient is a, is a quantum process that allows these, um, these energy packages to be funneled always in the optimal way, right? And, and so we, he studies this process for a while. At that time, we were studying tubulin, okay? And we were actually studying tubulin in the nucleus. And we, while looking at the structure in general of tubulin, I noticed that certain arrangement of particular amino acids, especially tryptophans, were aligned in, in a way um, that suggests perhaps that they are quantum coherent. And so I contacted Greg. Can we do perhaps similar experiments as to measuring um, 
a quantum energy transfer in, in a living cell, in the cytoskeleton. The idea here is that basically the cytoskeleton serves as a little quantum computer inside of cells to allow cells for, for certain um, more complicated uh, aspects like information transfer that can happen very rapidly and other processes to occur. I think it's fitting in the realm of kind of the topic for your lab is thinking outside the box, right? I mean, that's what you guys are all about here. It's an incredibly difficult project because here we are really, I can talk to a virologist, right? It's still a biologist, a physicist. They have a very different way of thinking about science. And so the, the postdoc we had for a while was a, a joint uh, postdoc, right? He was in my lab creating uh, two Boolean structures, taking um, uh, samples to, to Princeton, needed to be housed in both schools of thought, so to say. And, and this turned out to be very difficult. Similarly, it is incredibly difficult to get funding for something like this, because again, um, it is spanning um, too, too broad of disciplines in, in a way, right? But I think it's important work at the end. Uh, Everything is a quantum process, even in the set. Why not to look for it? Yeah, absolutely. I think like what you're alluding to, you're at a great place to to study all these things. I mean, you're at Mount Sinai. It's a unique place for the work that you do since it's a clinical hospital with the emphasis on translational research, you know, like all that we're talking about here today. You've been there for more than a decade now, just about a decade, just down the road from Daylon in New York City, of course. So can you give us an overview of what you think are the strengths of Mount Sinai and what, what makes it perfectly positioned for the work that you do? So one, one of Mount Sinai's strengths is being really in Manhattan and being surrounded by an enormous density of other research institutions that we benefit from. Again, in, in, for me, uh, the ability to collaborate we collaborate with a researcher at Columbia, a fly researcher, Laura Johnston. The postdoc just has to take the bus and go up there. Right? We collaborate with other researchers at NYU and so on and so forth. So that research density being in a research hub is certainly one advantage. Um, second is uh, the research endeavor. Mount Sinai's research endeavor is embedded in a medical school and I believe the biggest hospital in New York. So, so it provides that intellectual framework for biomedical research. It's not an isolated institute or university. It's really embedded in that framework. And I think this uh, um, transpires through and through in every research effort Mount Sinai is engaged in, in the scientists they are recruiting, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Arun, you know, too, a big academic center, when you have all these stakeholders, right, the academic, you know, basic, the clinical, the patients, the advocates, everybody it has a has an interest there. Um, and, you know, that leads to a lot of collaboration and communication, also awareness of, of all the, the synergies that are available. And, you know, I will say modestly that New York happens to be a, a highly dense, as Thomas was alluding to, uh, center of academic centers. So it's a real boon. Um, I'm going to ask one last question here about uh, another thing you do, in addition to one of your many responsibilities at Sinai, Paradis, elsewhere. You're also director at the Pathways to Stem Cell Science, which is a, a private sector nonprofit organization that aims to kickstart the careers of aspiring scientists by providing them with real wet lab experiences that can prepare them for a career in the biosciences. Tell us about Pathways and what drew you to the organization. So it's a uh, be beautiful thing to bring science already into middle schools and high schools. The problem is the logistic. Schools are not set up to do any kind of tissue culture. So if you want to bring stem cell science or cell biology into schools, you will need some kind of framework. What the Pathways was able to do is to, to set up basically a research facility. It's like a core, like a stem cell core. And, uh, and to invite students, all ages, to both conduct experiments, plan experiments. There's a seminar room where they learn about uh, their activities. And I, 
I'm um, convinced that this is something really important to bring even things that normally cannot be done in, in the classical school format in, into schools. And certainly cell biology belongs to this. And so I supported this. Um, this is why I'm part of the team. Yeah, it's uh, such an important part of the work that we all do as scientists is kind of the the next, think about the next generation, right? In inspiring, assisting with the next generation, helping them achieve their career goals. So so thank you for doing that. And thank you for being here on the show. It's been a, a great journey in terms of thinking about and talking about all the amazing out of the box things that your lab does, in particular with the, the bad IPSC story, which is just mind blowing to me. It's just, just the process of making that happen, the logistical part of it. And it's the, the, the results speak for themselves, I think. So thank you again. And we're going to ask you a couple of tail end peripheral questions that we like to ask the the guests here on the show science adjacent perhaps so first off if you could answer any single scientific question regardless of your expertise or your chosen field what would it be it would be why do we have dna to me it is something really annoying and disturbing all the other systems in physics have um a certain way of how how um the universe is structured. However, life is based on a Turing machine, right? It's a code. And I would like to know how, when this transition happened and why it exists in the first place. In other ways, can you imagine life without uh, DNA? Yeah, that's a good one. I would say <laughs> that's definitely worth exploring, I would say. Uh, and finally, if you are not a scientist, and it's hard to imagine you not being a scientist, what would you be? I can answer that question quite easily, because before I was a scientist, I was a medical doctor. Hmm. And uh, and I, I really had a lot of fun with this job, too. Right? And uh, in a way, it left a certain emptiness for, for more in terms of discovery, of course. And this is why I went to Jamie, Jamie to learn stem cell biology. But, but um, I could easily see myself also having stayed in, in this profession as a medical doctor, and I would be probably equally happy. Well, I get it. Asking questions, solving problems, right? That's the theme of your career and your existence. I feel like it's just unlike most people who ask ambitious questions, you're asking crazy questions. Life without DNA. I mean, you, your ambition, uh, I admire, uh, as well as your output. And uh, more than anything, appreciate you sharing all these ideas with us and our listeners and the world. Uh, Thomas Zwaka, thank you so much for being on the show today. And we really look forward to your next big idea. Um, it's really an inspiration to all of us scientists, as well as students uh, of the field. Uh, you really are quite a piece of work. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, that brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. A great story from Zvaka about the bats and their IPS cells. We got another one coming at you pretty soon. Until then, thank you so much for listening.